slightly more than eight decades ago, the world witnessed an event that still receives very little attention. But for students of literary history, and in particular, those who admire the work of George Orwell, Summer 1931 should be commemorated as a landmark event. In August 1931, Eric Blair published an essay, or was it a short story, in the journal Adelphi, edited by his acquaintances John Milton Murray and Max Plowman. Eighty years later, we can look back and appreciate the significance of that historical moment. My argument today is encapsulated in my title, A Hanging, Orwell's Literary Breakthrough. My argument will be the following. August 1931 represents an extraordinary moment in which Orwell overreached himself. That is, he ascended to a level of literary and intellectual ability that he had never experienced before, and indeed would not experience again for several years. He fell back, as it were, <laughs> after this. Put another way, in August 1931, Eric Blair became George Orwell. It is during the summer of 1931 when he composed and published a hanging. Eric Blair accessed the literary power that later would become the signature of George Orwell's greatest work, both in fiction and nonfiction. What I'd like to do then today is to look more closely at this breakthrough essay or story and show how it is designed, it's three parts, the biographical context in which it appears, that is, at what precise stage of Orwell's intellectual and literary development did it occur and why, the way in which the hierarchy of genres, that is to say, fiction versus nonfiction, story versus essay, played a decisive role both in the possibility of a hanging becoming a breakthrough event and also why it was limited to that single essay or story at that moment. And then finally, how it is that Blair became Orwell. How he then permanently consolidated in later years the flight, the peak experience that was a hanging into a plateau experience. It is a level on which he permanently remained to use the psychological language of Abraham Maslow, the great humanist psychologist of the 1960s and 70s. So then, a hang. First of all, we need to confront the controversy as to whether or not a hang is an essay or a story. Many commentators have treated it as nonfiction, saying that uh, there's no clear biographical evidence that Orwell ever attended 
a hanging during his service in Burma between 1922 and 1926. Others dispute this and say that uh, it probably is indeed based on biographical fact and is not a story. Clearly, however, it has elements that are based in some kind of experience, yet also a richness of descriptive detail that certainly is the stuff of great literature. Reports have emerged that Orwell attended some executions. There were several hundred during his time of service in the Indian Imperial Police. His first biographer, Bernard Crick, has established that Orwell would have had several postings during which he would have had many opportunities to attend hangings. My own view then is that the richness of this story, of this work, is so great that I do not believe that Eric Blair possessed at that time the raw imaginative power ex nihilo from nothing, ab ovo from <laughs> its own origin, to have come up with this without any experience. Clearly he had some acquaintance with hangings that serves at least as the foundational point or root of the story to which he added a great deal of imagination. The story is divided Let's call it a short story for the moment, into three parts. Part one, the setting. Part two, the focus on the protagonist, the hanged man. And part three, attention to the observers, the witnesses, the audience, and by implication, the audience, the readers. Part one, the setting. The man to be hanged is unknown. He remains unidentified. We know virtually nothing about him. We do not know the crime for which he has been convicted. We do not know whether he is possibly innocent or is definitely guilty. Clearly Orwell wants to narrow our point of attention to the event itself. Rather than introduce any questions about whether or not he should or should not be hanged, about the justice of the system, there is no telling here, there is only showing the mark of a very skilled fiction writer. Show, not tell. The key event in part one of the story, an apparently throwaway event, is the appearance of a dog, a half Airedale, half pariah, like the prisoner himself, who suddenly appears on the scene and begins barking and yapping, full of life and vitality, in contrast to the hangman and the other observers and the man who will soon be hanged, literally dead. The scene is deadened. The dog represents a vitalistic, animated presence that reminds us of what life is about. And fittingly enough, after barking and yapping merrily, running up, jumping throughout the courtyard where the man is to be hanged, 
and then going up and attempting to lick the man who was about to be hanged until the dog is pulled away. The dog seems to be grieving in advance the decision to extinguish this life, whether or not the execution is being conducted according to norms of human justice or not. Something we never do find out. The dog life is seen deadened. The victim soon to be dead himself. Having set the scene, Blair then moves to part two to focus on the man himself. He is being marched, as in the movie Dead Man Walking, to the gallows. And then the narrator, Blair, notices something that also recalls to us life and how life clings, clings to everything that is here on this earth to the last possible moment. The man who is about to be dead as he is walking sidesteps a pile, a puddle of water, as if that will matter in a few moments. But so long as you're alive, you will sidestep a puddle. And the narrator reflects with deep insight how much this reminds me that at this time, the man who's still one of us, still part of this human race, still breathing as you and I breathe, even though minutes later, none of that would be the case. So the middle part of the story fully humanizes the prisoner before us. We see that he is one of us, a live human being, breathing, walking, trying to remain dry, just as we would. And then the third final part, where we shift away from the scene in field focus or the prisoner focus to the surrounding observers, the witnesses, and by implication, us as readers. The man now hanging on the gallows and a hundred yards away the group of policemen, among them, Eric Blair. The captain tells an assistant to go fetch some gin so they could have a drink, clearly to break the tension. And then one of the Burmese servants talks about a previous hanging that he had attended in which he remarks that the man's legs continued to flap for a few moments even after the hanging. And he and a couple of other people had to try to fight and stop this movement of the legs. And they began to complain in a kind of humorous way Sir, you're making this so difficult for us, they would say to the corpse. Please, please, remain still. 
and all the police bystanders, including Eric Blair, found themselves suddenly laughing hysterically. But the narrator Blair makes clear that the laughter is forced and tense, and it is quickly interrupted by several downings of shots of gin. As the Burmese servant continues to prattle on, please, sir, please stop. You're making this so difficult. You're making this so difficult for all of us. And Eric Blair concludes a hanging with a single sentence that constitutes the entire final paragraph. The dead man was a hundred yards away. leaving us the question, not only of larger justice of this execution, but rather who deserved to remain alive and who to be executed? Indeed, who is really dead? <laughs> All done by showing there's not a moment of preaching in this story essay. An extremely powerful, arresting, 2,000 word burst of literary craftsmanship that amount to a kind of encapsulated genius. When we look at the context, biographically and intellectually, we see that this was indeed a supreme moment in Orwell's development. Nothing before or immediately after would prepare or consolidate this flight to an Elysian island, somehow in realms above the ordinary capacities to which Eric Blair had demonstrated himself capable. At the same time, Orwell wrote two throwaway novels that he destroyed, several short stories whose titles we only know that he had submitted when he was living in Paris to various magazines in London, all of which became rejected. A couple of book reviews, quite pedestrian. A similar kind of nonfiction work about being down and out to what his later down and out in Paris and London would become, called The Spike, published just a couple of months beforehand. A very ordinary piece of prose that clearly was of the substandard of Eric Blair. For five years after returning from Burma, 1927 to the end of 1932, Eric Blair struggled to become a writer. His cousin, Ruth Pitter, often saw him during his breaks from tramping expeditions in the East End of London and would remark on reading some of his work that it was truly laughable, so expertly. And she was a very supportive cousin, beginning to become a serious writer herself. And she recalled in interviews that Bernard Crick conducted in his first biography that she and her friends would always have a good joke about poor Eric thinking that he could become a writer. How deluded he And except for a couple of book reviews and a nondescript essay, he published nothing during those years. 
was it that it became the lone example of Orwell's talent of Blair becoming more alone. I believe it has much to do with the hierarchy of genres that have traditionally prevailed and to which Blair and Orwell fully subscribe. That is, that fiction vastly outranks nonfiction or even faction, combination of a story and essay, and that the supreme example of fiction is the novel. So that imaginative works of literature, not expository works of literature, are what one should strive for. And so Blair Orwell seems to have made a very sharp divide in his mind that only in later years did he overcome and we witnessed the combination of the two in his great dystopia, 1984, and in his fable, Animal Farm, which Alex Worthing has referred to as didactic fantasies. It is clearly essayistic fiction aiming to instruct, not only provide entertainment, ours is too great, emphases in the art of poetry to instruct it is with certain pedagogical emphasis didactic fantasies animal farm 1984 and with the great essays themselves such as politics and English language possessing an imaginative power that goes beyond the essay form and accesses, taps the language and sensibility of great imaginative literature. But this was all to await much, much later, more than a decade, 15 years later in the mid-1940s. Here in 1931, while still in the middle of his apprenticeship and his gaining of experience going down and out in Paris and London. Eric Blair, for the most part, seems to have classified anything that was nonfiction as inferior. Book reviews, essays are meant to be tossed off with your left hand, whereas you put your talent, your gifts, your best energy into fiction, and preferably into a long work of fiction, a novel that will endure, that will stand with the great works. Because of this bias, one common to his generation, and indeed still quite, quite common to our own, I believe that Blair never fully acknowledged his own natural gifts, which were expository and inventive, rather than purely creative, ab ovo, just out of the imagination. And so, throughout the 1930s, he wrote realistic novels about which he was not so proud, thinking he kept having to be a novelist. He has to be a novelist. Instead of seeing that, beginning with hanging, and then confirmed indisputably five years later with his great essay, Shooting an Elephant, which was the companion piece derived from his experience in Burma, that Orwell's gifts were primarily in the essay format. This would, of course, be further demonstrated in 1937, in 1938, with his full-length works, The Road to Wigan Pier, and Homage to Catalonia. That is, reportage, documentary works that had much more in common with essays than with fiction. If this were indeed Orwell's gift, his natural 
talent. One that emphasized sense more than sensibility. It wasn't until his first essay collection, Inside the Whale, published in 1940, which included essays of the title on Henry Miller, Inside the Whale, plus Charles Dickens, that we see Orwell finally admitting to himself his talent as a great essayist. And then, as I said a moment ago, later, hinting upon the insight that he could write fiction that did not have to be in any kind of traditional or even experimental novel format. It didn't have to be a realistic novel like Dickens and Hard Times, but it didn't have to be an experimental novel like Joyce's Ulysses either, upon which Orwell's forgettable novel, The Clergyman Daughter, is partly based in its style, in its experimentation. No, he could reach for new genres that he could craft, such as the fable, the dystopia, and include both essayistic and imaginative elements, weaving this into a genre that subscribed to his unique repertoire of gifts. That was the final, ultimate breakthrough in the mid-1940s that he achieved. But what I'd like to emphasize is that beginning in a hanging, the characterization of the prisoner and of the observers, including the narrator, Eric Blair himself, the setting of the scene possess a wealth of fineness of perception that already shows us George Orwell on the horizon, the crystal spirit. In August 1931, this crystal spirit momentarily crystallized itself in the form of a hanging. But because he continued to have the conviction about the supremacy of fiction over essay, novel rather than expository writing, August 1931 represents merely a peak. He then fell back for the next few years, with even down and out in Paris and London, certainly not of the level of talent demonstrated in a hanging. It wasn't not until he re-accessed his Burmese experience via shooting an elephant that we again see this combination of imaginative power and rootedness and experience that would characterize his best work of later years. And so, 80 years ago, A little story essay appeared in the pages of Adelphi that showed us the glimmer of Eric Blair becoming George Orwell. Not as far as his film The Plume was concerned, that was in January 1933 with the publication of Down and Out in Paris and London. I speak rather in an intellectual and literary sense. This is the real moment where Eric Blair became George Orwell. The real internal moment in which he became the writer who he was later meant to be. Unfortunately, my guess is that even he did not consciously realize it at this time, which is why he did not fully affirm that moment and proceed from it. It took him another several years of struggle and self-exploration to begin to see that his talents were unique and they would require a unique approach to be fully realized.